afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome, first of all, to a very sunny Liverpool, and welcome to the first TFN board meeting as a subnational transport colony. And it's a truly momentous occasion to be leading the way to the devolution of power in England. And I'd like to give this opportunity to thank everyone who's participated in the partnership board to get to the stage in the past, to all our constituent authorities for their assistance in getting us to this stage today, and to the Department of Transport, and again for working with us to get to the stage today. And a particular thank you from me to the Transport of the North staff who have put on a Herculean effort to get us here um, at this moment in time in such good order and ready to move forward and delivering on the great platform that's been established so far. So, welcome all. And I would first of all like to um, ask if there are any declarations of interest relevant to the business of this meeting that anybody wishes to declare at this stage. No, no declaration of interest. Just as a, an aside to that, during the meeting, if you're I'm aware of a declaration of interest you think is relevant, it will be an opportunity to make it during the course of the meeting as well. And I would like to um, note apologies from Tees Valley, the North East Combined Authority, and North East Lincolnshire. Um, and I believe that is all the apologies we have. Good. Moving on to item two of the agenda, um, we're absolutely delighted to have Joe Johnson here today, uh, MP, Minister of State for the Department for Transport. And um, again, um, working closely with the department is going to be a key issue for us all going forward. Um, they have the money, we'd like to see it from the north. Um, and uh, I'd like to hand over to Joe now to, to say a few words about my discussion. Joe, thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, thanks, Barry. And it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon. It's lovely to see you. And I want to echo Barry's words of congratulations. This is a really historic achievement. Uh, we now have the first national, sub-national, regional transport report uh, on the statute. Yeah. 
very much to a very happy night if you don't look at the floor for any questions that anybody would like to ask, if there's any comments that anybody would like to make. Okay, sorry about that. It's just, uh, as I was saying, uh, welcome the Minister's comments and uh, the like of you there to come today. I think for us in the Northwest, and particularly for us on the West Coast of Cumbria, it's the affordability and the, uh, the need to start and get some infrastructure working now in our neck of the woods. Because the huge programme of uh, potential investment in there, uh, particularly on the railway, the West Coast, uh, line in particular, programs of work that need to get started very quickly otherwise half this is involved with this and like to start the Well thank you. I mean you know like the four ways that the public very much is seeing when we have got the iconic in this place and the problem. I understand from John following our brief conversation earlier that you're working towards uh, a draft business case that will be ready for the department to consider um, in the late autumn, and that's a good and ambitious timetable. We look forward in the department to helping you develop what we want to see as investable, affordable, strong value for money programs. I'm just checking this mic. Yeah. So, so thank you. Another couple of representatives, just building on, uh, on Keith's question. Um, understand that a lot of the ambition here is around 30 years and long, scale, long time scales. Some of the work we're doing in Cumbria, we need to bring our cases to fruition really over the next three months. Because of the time scales on railways, we know if we don't start building in the next three months, we will lose that opportunity because businesses will have to find other solutions or will be a barrier to them even starting and some very significant businesses have been partnering with us over the last 16 months to develop those. And I look forward, we work, I've worked with many partners around the table to continue to develop those cases and try not lose momentum as we also work on the longer term plans in parallel and I accept there's going to be a bit of both. Yeah, indeed, I mean just because we're working on a, a long term view for Northern Power as well doesn't mean we're not also investing significant amounts. Uh, in the north of England at the moment, and, and you know we are, I mean, £13 billion pounds, uh, between 2015 and 2020, uh, it, that's a significant sum of money, more than any government has ever spent in this part of the country in such a period before. And you know, where there are shovel-ready value-for-money schemes with strong business cases, the department is you know, keen to look out for. Any further questions from the floor? The microphone's here if anybody's... Minister, thank you very much um, for your uh, time and for your good wishes for Transport for the North as well. That's very much appreciated. Um, we will be bringing forward bold and ambitious plans and uh, <coughs> the strategic outline business case for Northern Powerhouse Rail will be bringing forward a draft over the summer, aiming to have that final submission by December. And this, for us, is transformational for the whole Northern economy. The thing we'd always emphasise 
is equally important for the UK as a whole as it is for the North. I think that's the big point I would like to make on behalf of the, the members is that you know, our work is important to the UK, not just to the North. So, Judith, you want to? Thank you. Um, Judith Blake, leader of Leeds City Council, here today representing the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. I, I think it's fair to say that um, we're all very pleased to welcome you here today. Um, and just to really give a very strong message that the North has woken up. And we do recognise, uh, in spite of your comments, that there has been a shortfall in funding. And there is very high expectation that together, 19 transport authorities working together, have, uh, we've got a clout that we haven't had before. Um, I, I just wondered how you would answer some of the people who um, are disappointed that we haven't got the same powers as Transport for London. And we know why, but I just think it's clear, we need to be clear that we're on the same page. And I think really what we all want to hear today is a very firm commitment to um, taking our, our well worked at plans, we're well advanced with our plans and we will be submitting um, by the autumn, and we do hope to see um, a response to that in the um, in the autumn statement or, or the whatever it's called these days. Um, uh, the um, but really, um, you know, the North expects now. We do have a, a, a sense of grievance. I think it's fair to say that we haven't had what is rightfully ours. Um, but uh, equally from us, you have our commitment that we are all prepared um, to play our part to rebalance the economy and to make sure that everything we do is for benefit to those of us in the North, but also to the country as a well. whole. Thank you, Bob. I mean, I think this is, this is something we need to celebrate, but we now have the North speaking as one voice to a powerful standing before me for the first time. And I don't think that means that the North is a stronger voice in policy making to give it a greater weight when it comes to the allocation of resources. So if there is a grievance, I think this is a great way to remedy that grievance. I do think we are returning to the Chinese Secretary of Justice to make sure that we can come to the best of the significant amounts of money that the other governments and civil rights have done. But we want the law to be taken in a great way to enable that to happen. Because we have powers relative to the TFL, It's great to see you here today. You're not the only one telling for the first time. That, that includes me as well. So it is. Uh, it, it's um, good to be in, in the uh, in the position where we are really moving things forward. It feels to me like the debate about transport in the north is entering a new phase today. That's how it feels. You know, we're moving a lot of debate and a lot of maybe rhetoric to a point where we really are getting ready now to make serious investments in the transport infrastructure of the north, and that, that is a that is a great uh, thing. But I suppose it's picking up on your last comment. We're at a point where maybe the government's view, or let's say HS2's view, of where it's currently up to in terms of its plans, are not necessarily fully aligned yet with what some of the partners around this at this table might uh, might think. And I suppose the question I would have is just about how we get this relationship right as we kind of go through what will be a critical series of decisions now linked to HS2 at Manchester Piccadilly um, as we begin to then. Plans for Northern Powers Rail. You know, 
a statutory body, but one where we've not got quite all alignment yet necessarily with where the government currently is up to. And it's just about how do you see us managing those those issues in the in the coming period? It's, from my point of view, you know, make this plain. Point scoring is out. You know, it's not about point scoring. It's about us getting the right solution for the north of England and having the conversation like this in in a, in a, in a across the table way. But I just want to be clear that we're not, you know, by we're not kind of becoming too much a mouthpiece of the DFT that we still retain our own ability to argue for what we think is is right for the north. It should be good to hear from you how you how you see that. Well, I think this is a, a very important body to make the strongest possible strategic case to the north of England so that it gets a proper share of available transport uh, capital expenditure over the next 30 to 50 years. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a real achievement that it can now speak with one voice in this way. Of course, you know, there are going to be difficult decisions to take at various points in time. There's never an infinite amount of capital expenditure that government can, can make in any given period and inevitably that means prioritization and careful attention to value for money and affordability in the assessment of business cases. But we want to invest for the long term. We do recognize that the productivity gap in this country is a result in no small part of uh, differences in uh, the quality of the embedded infrastructure and that there is a gap to be made up. And we want to ensure that bodies such as the Partnership for the North and Transport for the North really play their part in making sure that the best possible case is put to government for the allocation of resources in this part of the country. Unfortunately, um, I think the Minister has to leave at this point. There's no time for any further questions. Well, time for one more question? Is there one at the bottom? Of Um, uh, Bob Othman from North Lincolnshire. So obviously ours is very different. It's very gr it's great to be sitting with the powerhouses of the cities uh, around the table from where from being a, a, a small unitary authority. But I think I would absolutely welcome the comments that the ministers made about financial commitment. And I also we all have to accept that this is not an endless bottomless pit. So. I think my question really is, you use the word minister, um, the word transformation. This is a really big and modern word when it comes to devolving powers from government, but also thinking differently about how those powers can be used in uh, local areas. Um, I wonder, do you have a view on how um, we as a body can prove our credibility, that we can be absolutely in sync with you when it comes to developing the business cases? So we've got to, we can be treated fairly and comparably compared to other areas that need the money too. Well, I'll just start off by saying that the Department of Transport you know, has processes within it, it's big, invest, big investment committees, for, for, to name one in the jargon, which will be looking very carefully at the strategic outline business case that transport uh, for the North. Uh, develops and when that's ready in the, in the summer in draft form and then in more final form uh, towards the late autumn, it will go to those critical investment committees for careful consideration and it will be ranked you know, in, a, in a careful and evidence-based way along with other claims on, as you know, limited amounts of money available across the country. But of course, this is a great forum now for the development of the strongest possible case for more investment here in the north of England, that's what we that's really what we are so excited about with the, with the creation of this body as on a statutory footing for the first time. Okay, well, um, we'll we'll draw that item on the agenda to close. So, what I'd like to do very much is, uh, Joe, thank you very much for being here today. Um, I think it's really helped us to mark this great day uh, in a very special way. So, thank you very much for being here. And I'll leave her off to have a, a meeting now with, uh, with the, the mayor. So uh, good luck to that meeting too.
apparently there's a late apology, or an, is there an apology from East Riding, or is East Riding on? <coughs> so we have a late apology from East Riding, um, which um, means we'll have to change our plans so in terms of the co option arrangement, but I'll come on to that under item four. Um, but in the um, Moving on to item three of the agenda, um, what I would ask at this stage is that the uh, representatives of the constituent authorities give approval for the shadow board minutes, the shadow board minutes of the meeting held in uh, Newcastle on Thursday, the 8th of February. So, um, first of all, are there any matters anybody wishes to raise for the minutes? And if not, we'll agree those uh, are the approved minutes from that meeting. Thank you for that. So, item four, um, so at this stage of the meeting, the um, the members are the nineteen constituent authorities. <coughs> And um, we've noted the apologies for absence for the initial three. Um, sorry, and um, East Riding have added their apology. Um, all those members have given consent to the formal uh, matters to be considered where unanimous approval is required. So that's just the final one that's just come in. So that means um, when we're looking at matters where all 19 constituent authorities have to agree, such as co-option, then the members here, plus the consent being given by those who are absent, means that can take place. So, um, moving on to item four of the agenda, um, what I would ask that we do at this stage um, is invite the constituent authority members here to co-opt uh, John Cridland as a member of the Transport for the North <coughs> board. So can I ask by a show of hands that the, those representing the constituent authorities agree that to be so. So could you show your hands now please? Anyone not agreeing to it? Okay. Thank you. So that means, John, you're not co-opted as a as a, a member of the Transport for the North Board. Can I ask, if, if relevant, can you make any declarations of interest? No declarations. So the next step for me then is to ask again the constituent authority members here to uh, appoint a person to chair its meetings of the TFM Board for 2018-19, so for the 12 months ahead. Um, so again, um, the, uh, can I ask someone to make a proposal for the Chair of um, Transport for the North? Uh, John yeah, a proposal for John Cridland. And a second. And a second. So again, can I ask just for a show of hands to show So that, again, in terms of approval, thank you very much. So therefore, John Cridland is duly appointed as um, Chair of Transport for the North. I therefore would like to hand over to John to continue with the rest of the meeting. Well, Barry, that's very kind. <laughs> and entirely unexpected. <laughs> thank you, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, for your support, which is much appreciated. It is a historic day. Um, and this is doing something that's never been done before in the North, and I'm very privileged to have the opportunity to make a small contribution to assisting in this very important journey that starts now. Now, we have quite a lot of people for whom this is their first Transport for the North meeting, but I don't think it would be appropriate to me to welcome them individually, because in fact it's everybody's first meeting, because this is the first meeting. So you are all very, very welcome. We have some very important constitutional matters that we need to get through and do them properly, accountably, transparently, 
They can come across as a little dry, but they allow us to operate properly and officially from today onwards. So just bear with me as we do that. The Constitution also has a provision for the appointment of two vice chairs of transport for the North from the statutory local authority members. So I'm asking those present from local authorities whether there are any candidates for proposal for vice chair. Not at this stage. This is something that you may wish to take off line and deal with and we'll come back to at a subsequent meeting. It's not essential. You may remember at the shadow board there was a proposal. Let me leave it to local authority colleagues to um, debate this separately and come back with a proposal at the next meeting. Yes, Julie. Could I, could I just clarify, Chair, that uh, having read the minutes, because I wasn't at the meeting, uh, that one vice chair would be So, um, Julie didn't have the mic at that point, so just for the benefit of everybody in the room, she was asking whether the idea of having two vice chairs was that they would come from the two current leading political parties as represented by the Democratic vote. Clearly, Julie, that was a matter discussed in the shadow board and I wasn't present at that meeting, but my understanding is that was the intention, that um, this is a matter for agreement by board members that there would be two vice chairs and at any one time they would represent two principal political parties as demonstrated by board membership. So I think those two groupings maybe just need to take this matter offline and um, you do have a chair, um, but if you wish to have two vice chairs, come back with a proposal for our June meeting. Okay, thank you very much. I think that concludes item four which are the procedural matters we need to deal with in order to operate within the law as a new statutory body. Is everybody happy to move on to item five? Item five, then, is about the adoption of our constitution, and I'm going to invite Sasha Wayne, our head of legal, to the table in order to contribute to this item. There are a series of decisions of adoption we need to make, and because of the complexity of the matters, um, I think it's better that Sasha introduces them one at a time and then we take a board mandate on each item separately. Sasha. So, um, good afternoon everybody. Um, before I start the report itself, I just wanted to bring to members' attention um, a letter that has been received um, from a member of the public together with the TFN Chief Executive Response. This has been provided to you today for your information. So moving on to um, item five, which is the uh, Constitution report. Uh, by way of summary, um, as a corporate body, Transport for North is required to have a constitution and members are asked today to adopt the draft constitution. The current constitution has been prepared um, to reflect the primary legislation, the regulations and the proposal that was submitted to the Secretary of State. Uh, an early draft of the constitution was provided to constituent authorities via their legal officers and they have been involved in the consultation. The draft constitution was also discussed and endorsed in principle by TFN's shadow board on the 8th of February. Uh, and members, uh, please note that each of the issues that were raised have now been addressed in the draft constitution. In addition to the um, draft constitution approvals, there are a number of other recommendations for members, which I will pick up in turn as we continue through the report. So that leads us to um, 1.6 recommendation. So on 1.6 recommendation, um, are we in a position to adopt the constitution? Yes, please. Of course. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, obviously a huge amount of work has gone into this and for those of us who are who weren't on the, the shadow uh, board it is uh, a lot to be presented with at, our, at the first meeting and I recognise that um, you know this probably is the product of a lot of uh, doing and throwing and thinking and it's a very a very sound piece of work I suppose my only concern is is coming back to the point I raised with the minister about independence and whether the constitution sufficiently guarantees 
the independent voice of transport for the North. And I wouldn't, I won't go through the detail now, but a couple of bits have been put, pointed to me that kind of suggest that, you know, that have we really defined our relationship clearly enough with the Department for Transport? And, you know, could it be a bit stronger? Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that to sound negative, I'm not, not wishing to, to, to say that today. But it was just simply to say, you know, it, to be presented with this and, you know, to almost say, say that's it. And almost maybe not tease out some of the, uh, the issues as they might arise. I just wonder whether you know, we could review it after a certain point in time, you know, whether we could um, adopt it today, recognising that it's a big step forward and it, 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 we need a, a working constitution, but to then adopt it in the light of practice and experience, maybe within six months or a year, uh, so that if we need to you know, uh, strengthen maybe the, the independent voice element at some point in time, that, that we've got the option to do that. Thank you very much for that. Yes, there are provisions within the Constitution that allow for amendments, so that's certainly something that we can take forward. Thank you. I think that's very wise counsel, Andy, and clearly this is a moving feast over time, uh, and things will change, and we need to learn by experience. So we will have that six-month review. Uh, obviously, for the benefit of those for whom this is the first meeting, as Sasha described, this is a milestone on a very long existing process, many months of negotiation with the central government to become the first subnational authority, and these matters have been to previous board members with some detail, but that is a very helpful uh, intervention. On that basis, are we adopting the constitution? Thank you. Anybody against? Thank you very much. Next, Sasha. So um, item two on the um, report re refers to membership. So members um, of TFM made up of representatives of the 19 constituent authorities and the co-opted members. Each of the constituent authorities have been asked to confirm the identity of the nominated member and also a substitute member. And a list of those nominated appears as, as Appendix C of the report. Okay, is that list noted? Yeah. Thank you. Item 2.2 of the report deals with co-option. The TFM regulations do provide for representatives of the six Rail North authorities to be co-opted onto the TFM board, as well as the independent chair of the partnership board. The shadow board, at its meeting in February, recommended that representatives from the 11 LEPs, HS2, Network Rail and Highways in England should all also be invited to um, be co-opted onto the board. The voting members um, of TFN must all agree to the co-options um, and uh, I can confirm that I have consent from North East member, North East Lincolnshire member, Tees Valley member and East Ridings member who unfortunately are unable to attend today. Okay, now this is an, an important formal decision. It would therefore maintain the <coughs> membership and culture of operations while we have been a voluntary partnership of civic and business leaders sitting together as equals. Um, that is the proposal, that we co-opt the LEP representatives, the national delivery partners, very much reflecting the strength of the movement that is Transport for the North, alongside the rail authorities who have previously met separately as Rail North, but will in future be part of the TFN family. Um, does this proposal meet with your support? given it requires the decision of statutory local authority members, because I just have a show of hands in favour, anyone <coughs> against? Thank you very much. Carried. So that brings us on to item 2.3, which is the partnership. So item 2.3, I have an interest in this item, so I think I should temporarily step out of the room. And uh, given we haven't elected a vice chair, I can't ask anybody to take that on for me. Um, this is simply establishing the arrangements for the partnership board. Liam, could I just ask you to bring anything to a vote that Sasha recommends to you? Yeah. You may wish to ask me to return, otherwise I'll go shopping. <laughs> 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 we even arranged for the weather for you, John, as well. But, um... Okay, so... On that kind of point, is there anything anyone wants to particularly raise? I think it's, it's reasonably 
uh, straightforward, is it? Um, yeah, I mean, um, is it okay to... Yeah, of course, absolutely. Um, so the regulations um, themselves do require TFN to establish a partnership board, um, which has a statutory um, advisory role. Um, in addition, there's also a requirement for the chair of the par partnership board to be co-opted as a member of the TFN board. Um, and um, who was proposed at the shadow board um, for that role was John Cribland. Um, the partnership board has a distinct and separate entity from the TFN board. It's advisory, with TFN being the decision-making body. With this in mind, um, it's important that each board meets separately um, and it's recommended that when partnership board meetings take place, these are held on the same day and at the same venue as TFN board. TFN boards will be timetabled to follow partnership board to enable partnership board to formulate its advice to TFN board. Thanks, Sasha. And that's straightforward in the continuation of how we, we operated in, in shadow for. Is everyone comfortable with that? Andy Johnson. Can I just clarify something? Will the board uh, have a partnership agreement, or will there be a document that supports the operation of the board? And is that still in development? Yeah, there's terms of reference, but um, at the moment we don't have the contract in place, but there are terms of reference with regards to protocols. But are they existing? To they're, they're in the um, constitution. Okay. I presume that can be um, all reviewed within the six monthly review that we're going to have anyway. So, with all that in mind, are we happy to have a show of hands if everyone's in favour of that? And sorry, Chair, can I just oh, remember, yeah. can I just confirm that we will need a show of hands to confirm the appointment of John Cridland as Chair? And can we do the same? And can we bring you back from the shops, please? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what's the smoke coming out of the chimney, Sasha? Chair. Very good, thank you very much for that. Right, um, let us move on then to the next item, which is the issue of voting. voting. Yeah, so with regards to voting, um, where a vote is required, votes will be weighted in accordance with population, with the exception of rail franchise matters, which are voted in accordance with rail passenger miles. Um, only the representatives of the 19 constituent authorities have voting rights. TFN has the power to agree to grant voting rights to co-opted members. The constitution provides for rail north authority rep representatives to be granted voting rights in relation to rail franchise matters, which, um, which um, reflects the submission proposals to the Secretary of State. So. Okay. Can I have people's support then for the voting arrangement? <coughs> Thank you very much. Important to get that established. We have never yet had a vote. We have operated by consensus. And where there have been differences, we have worked very hard to find the highest common factor. But there always has to be proper arrangements for voting in any statutory authority. Thank you very much. Let's move on then to audit and governance. Thank you, Chair. At Shadow Board, it was recommended that TFN should invite suitably qualified individuals to be independent members on the Audit and Governance Committee. Uh, we have completed a recruitment exercise and I'm pleased to confirm we have um, recruited three members, David Pevelin, Chris Melling and Kevin Brady. In addition, the meeting um, here, members are now invited to appoint four from the 19 constituent authority members to serve on the committee. So I'm looking for volunteers to sit on the Audit and Governance Committee and we really need four representatives from our local government colleagues. Anybody like to propose a name? Similarly to the Vice Chair, just do a little bit of work offline. Okay, could I leave that? Job of work then with our local authority colleagues. Thank you. Scrutiny committee. Thank you, Chair. The regulations require TFN to appoint a scrutiny committee consisting of one representative from each of the 19 constituent authorities um, and the nominated persons are listed at Appendix D. 
Uh, Shadow Board recommended that scrutiny committees should have the role of scrutiny first. Uh, so um, members please note that meetings of the committee will be scheduled to facilitate such contribution to enable the scrutiny committee's views to be reported to TFN Board and to inform its decision making. It's also anticipated that the scrutiny committee will operate through smaller scrutiny panels set up on a task and finish basis. People comfortable with the proposals for scrutiny? Very important function. Thank you. I think we've already tackled the Rail North Committee, have we not? Voting? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's just to confirm that the committee is made up of the 11 regional groups as further recommended in the Chateau Board. People comfortable with the Rail North Committee carrying forward that very important work from the organisation has now become part of the wider organisation. So, Sasha, what else does that leave us with? A word on standards? Yes, just quickly to mention that um, TFN doesn't have its own uh, code of conduct and therefore uh, members are um, asked to abide by the code of conduct for their appointing authority and for non-elected members um, they will be expected to adhere to the Nolan principles of conduct for public life. Is that noted by all colleagues, including our representatives? Thank you very much. Familiar territory, I think, for any of us involved in public service. And then finally, Sasha, the schedule of meetings. Yes. Um, so there is a provisional schedule of meetings for the TFN Board, Partnership Board, Scrutiny Committee, um, and that's uh, at Appendix E. There is also some proposed meetings for Executive Board as well. And um, Just to note that a schedule of meetings for audit and governance will be brought forward, hopefully at the next meeting. Very good. Are those duly noted in the diary? Thank you very much. I would like to propose that the next full meeting on the 28th of June, we should go back and meet in Manchester. Is that acceptable to people? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right, Sasha, does that complete our necessary constitutional matters? It does, thank you very much, Chair. Well, just echoing um, what I'm sure Barry would say, um, fantastic work by the team's legal services. So thank you to all of you for getting these very, very important matters properly rooted and properly agreed by board members. Okay, we'll move on then to item six, which is of a similar nature. It's the appointment of statutory officers. And I'm going to invite Dawn Madden just to join us at the table, HR and mobilization director who's been looking at this matter. We have a proposal, Dawn. Is there anything you would like to add to it? Happy to take it as read. So we're taking it as read. We're therefore bringing a proposal for a head of paid service, the Chief Executive Barry White, a monitoring officer, Sasha Wayne, who you've just met, and a Section 151 officer, in other words, Finance Director, um, Ian Craven. Are those appointments supported by the entire board? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that's done then. So we now move on to a cluster of strategic and financial planning issues. Again, um, for the benefit of new members here today, many of these have already been discussed at some considerable length, preparation of the business plan and preparation of the budget, but these are very important matters that need to be mandated and authorized today. So I'm inviting Ian Craven, the finance director, to come and join me at the top table. Now, given these have been covered extensively before, whilst there will be every opportunity for members to ask questions and make proposals, we're not going to go through them in huge depth unless there are proposals that people want to make, because I think in many cases this is the third time you've seen some of these. And similarly, we won't do lengthy opening questions.